take your seats. We're about to begin. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Colonial and Contemporary Land Appropriation and Dispossession in Search of Justice. Uh, this is our first major plenary um, co-organized by Dr. Margaret Abraham and myself. And before we begin with the presentations, I'd like to begin with a land uh, acknowledgement. So as noted in more detail in the opening ceremony, um, I would like to acknowledge that the land on which we gather is the traditional territory of the indigenous peoples of this region. And we have the longer version on screen um, for you to review. It's particularly fitting that we have a land acknowledgement today because of the topic that we are um, about to discuss for the next uh, hour and a half, two hours. This plenary panel addresses the historical processes of colonial and contemporary land dis uh, dispossession. Um, it will cover the um, uh, conceptual frameworks and empirical data that addresses colonial histories, context of land appropriation and the dispossession of indigenous peoples and, uh, and marginalized communities. So today I'm delighted to have three distinguished speakers. One of our speakers uh, was not able to make it, so Ariel Deranger is not, uh, is not here today, uh, but we do have three wonderful presenters and this will allow us also more time for questions at the end. Um, I will present, uh, I will introduce each speaker, um, they will each present their paper and then we'll have time for questions at the end and we'll have extra time for questions thankfully. So um, let's begin. Um, giving the paper entitled Dispossession, Justice and Social Science in the Beginning All the World Was America is Dr. Gurminder Bambra. She is Professor of Postcolonial and Decolonial Studies in the School of Global Studies at the University of Sussex. She is author of Connected Sociologies and Rethinking Modernity, Postcolonialism and the Sociological Imagination, which won the 2008 Philip Abrams Memorial Prize for Best First Book in Sociology. So over to you, Dr. Bambra. Thank you. Yesterday, we as members of the international sociological community were welcomed onto the unceded territories of indigenous peoples. Peoples who have both inhabited these lands for centuries and have been alienated from them as a consequence of settler colonialism. We were welcomed despite our discipline's complicity in the production of the inequalities that characterize our relationship. If we are to address these inequalities in a meaningful way, we must hold our discipline to account and ourselves along with it. Sociology takes as its remit the study of us, understood as modern, as opposed to the study of a traditional them assigned to anthropology. The differentiation of us and them on the basis of separate civilizational histories justifies attempts at understanding these differences within their endogenous dynamics, rather than locating them within the entangled histories that produce them. This obscures the connections and relations between places and peoples. It also naturalizes and reads back through history a separation which is more a conceit of emerging social theory than an adequately supported historical claim. As Uma Narayan notes, Rudyard Kipling's oft-quoted statement, oh, east is east and west is west and never the twain shall meet. This statement is articulated at a historical juncture when east and west are explicitly entangled in a series of protracted encounters, namely colonialism, dispossession, elimination, and enslavement. The consolidation of this conceit of historically separate entities and the institutional effacement of the connected histories of colonialism occurs in large part through the disciplinary organization of knowledge itself. It occurs through the presentation of modernity as a core conceptual category of sociology 
without recognizing the coloniality of its constitution. The perspective of connected sociologies, which I've set out in earlier work, starts from a recognition that events and histories are constituted by processes that are always broader than the selections that seemingly justify their theoretical constructs. While knowledge can never be total, the selections we make have consequences for its ordering, and this ordering is crucial for questions of justice in the present. One of, the key one of the key constituents of modernity is, as Hegel set out, the subject capable of property. This subject is further defined against two other understandings, the subject incapable of property and the subject indifferent to property. The modern European subject is defined in terms of self-ownership in the context of wider enlightenment discourses of emancipation and equality. However, such practices and discourses occur in the context of taking others into ownership and appropriating their means of subsistence and reproduction. Those subjects who are alienated from the idea of self-ownership by themselves being taken into ownership or more simply enslaved cannot just be included within the understandings of modern subjecthood. Those subjects who refuse self-alienation through their disavowal of the very idea of individuated property and who are dispossessed and annihilated in the process of the European expression of modern subjecthood, similarly are unable simply to be accommodated into definitions of the modern. Both of these groups stand outside of standard understandings of the modern subject epistemologically, but their outsider position is itself a consequence of historical actions undertaken by European subjects as the expression of their own modern subjectivity. As such, equality and justice cannot simply be extended to these other groups as a rhetorical trope. It has to be brought into being through an address of the previous forms of inequality that structured their epistemological and historical exclusion. I'll unpack these claims through a discussion of how the United States came to be identified as such, and of course these comments also pertain to other settler colonies, including the one we're in. The celebratory and exceptionalist rhetoric associated with the founding of the United States is often traced to Tocqueville's democracy in America. <coughs> the fact that the US is a new nation, he suggests, means that it's able to forge its own destiny free of the encumbrances of history and tradition that continue to inflect European political forms. As such, it's seen to embody a particular form of modernity, one that's purified from the residues of Europe's feudal past. It's seen not only to demonstrate the promise of emancipation, regarded as inherent to modernity, but also to be the first lived expression of this modern form of politics. Now, while many scholars take up this aspect of Tocqueville's work, few have gone on to address his other significant claim, namely that the land of the United States is occupied by three races, and that his account of democracy is primarily only about one of them. And that's because the history of the other two is of their subjugation by the very institutions and practices that are otherwise being praised. Institutions and practices that those other two races necessarily experience as tyranny. Focusing on indigenous people here, we see that the extent to which they're discussed within the terms of the history of the US is usually done within a historiographical frame organized around the idea of stadial development. Such a frame places native peoples in the prehistory of the US and regards their gradual disappearance as natural and inevitable, associated as it is with the linear movement of modernity itself. As Locke argued, in the beginning, all the world was America. Adam Ferguson similarly suggested that it's in the present condition of the natives of North America, quote, that we are to behold as in a mirror the features of our own progenitors. In this way, the encounter with native peoples was interpreted by Europeans as meeting their own ancestors and traveling across space became understood as traveling back in time. Despite existing at the same time as those who wrote about them, Native peoples were placed historiographically in an earlier time. And just as the ancients had given way to the moderns, 
It was believed that native peoples and their societies would give way to modern Europeans and their societies. This assumption of linear development was the basis for the justification of territorial dispossession and the elimination of peoples. It's incumbent upon sociology to take seriously the histories that contest those versions that are used to legitimate violence and plunder in the past and to rethink its concepts and categories on the basis of more robust understandings. The story of the new world, as Jody Bird suggests, is a horror and we ought not, I quote, to rationalize the originary historical traumas that birthed settler colonialism. Joan Cox, for example, points to the foundational violence that was involved in establishing the modern republic and to the erasure of that violence from most historical accounts. She highlights in particular, and I quote, the approximately 367 treaties signed by native peoples and ratified by the United States government by way of which Indian territory was turned into US territory and Indian country was transformed into settler property. As Jeanette Wolfley argues, federal efforts to assimilate Indians, obtain Indian lands and terminate tribal governments were not natural or preordained. They were not about the simple linear movement of modernity they were a direct consequence of deliberate policies and practices regarding the elimination and then dispossession of peoples. The modern world did not come into being through the endogenous European processes of industrial and political revolution as is still put forward in most standard sociological accounts. The modern world was birthed through settler and other forms of colonialism. And this marks not only the configuration of contemporary societies, but also the narratives we relate, including those associated with our political and social self-identities. In Europe, but also in the United States, politicians frequently tell us that we're in the middle of a refugee and migration crisis. That crisis is not constituted by the circumstances that cause people to move, but it's about their very presence at our borders and in our states. Indeed, this movement is often referred to in pejorative terms, such as an invasion or a flood, a swarm, or as a threat to our culture and our very way of life. And yet those who come, come committed to live according to the laws and norms of the countries to which they move. Let's contrast that for a moment with the historical practices of Europeans as they traveled across the Atlantic to make new lives and livelihoods for themselves and their families in the new world. Did they live according to the rules and norms of the people whose lands they entered? Or is it this movement, which continues to be presented as a migration, that really is better understood as an invasion? This movement is usually discussed without any mention of the founding violence that enabled it to happen or the violence that it continued to perpetuate. It is naturalized by a misguided belief that the lands were unoccupied or to use Weber's term, constituted free soil. Across the 19th century, 50 million or so Europeans left their countries of origin to make new lives for themselves on lands inhabited by others. Of these, 13.5 million alone were British. Approximately 10% of all European migrants journeyed overseas using a government subsidy, and national migration associations were set up to facilitate the movement of poor and unemployed Europeans. Those who left often remitted money back, pointing to the ways in which the wealth accrued through colonial endeavors was directly linked to the, to the development of the economy, and particularly local economies back home. The emergence of the archetypal modern new nation was only made possible as a consequence of the systematic elimination and dispossession of native peoples. And yet the coloniality of these processes rarely makes it into sociological accounts of modernity. Confusing colonial settlement as migration normalizes and legitimates violence in the past as the condition for continued violence against others in the present. <laughs> 
That is, the violence of imperial rule and colonial settlement disappears from histories of the nation, happening as it does outside the borders of the national state, as understood in the present, at the same time as arguments about national sovereignty are used to securitize borders in the present. Even those voices calling for open borders as a way to address issues of global inequality, voices such as Branko Milanovic, they are not immune from reproducing colonial tropes in their solutions, which seek to allow people to move freely for work, but without access to the rights of citizens in the countries in which they end up. In this way, the Enlightenment discourse of human rights, based on notions of modern subjectivity, is revealed once again as an exercise that, adv that advantages Europeans and European descended settlers in the New World and beyond. There is no modern or modern subjectivity that is not always and already colonial. Not addressing the colonial modern as the basis for the constitution of our discipline and our shared world impoverishes the work we may wish to do. Going back to the main theme of the paper, the calls for reconciliation made by some sociologists requires those who have lost lives, livelihoods, and land to be reconciled to historical and ongoing injustice. It maintains the problematic sociological frame of development that sees all others in relation to a modern us and eventually to be absorbed to us or to maintain themselves as distinct from us. It fails to recognize the connections, reflection on which might prompt us to consider what we need to do to establish ourselves in good relation with those who continue to bear the burdens of our expressed modern subjectivity. As many have argued, we need to use our sociological imagination to address the many issues confronting us in the present. But we cannot do this without accounting for how that imagination is itself disfigured by its failure to account for the coloniality that was the condition of its emergence. Any positive solutions that do not take seriously the shared histories that have produced global inequalities will always at best fail and at worst reproduce the coloniality from which they emerged. We need reparations and restitution, both epistemological and material, as any beginning from which justice in the world can be produced. Thank you. Thank you very much. And our next speaker is Dr. Maggie Walter, giving her presentation called Australian Indigenous Dispossession, the Link Between Land and Social Justice. Dr. Walter is Palawa. She is a professor of sociology and a pro vice chancellor of Aboriginal research and leadership at the University of Tasmania. Maggie has published extensively in the field of race relations, indigenous inequality, and research methodologies. She has numerous books, including Indigenous Children Growing Up Strong and Indigenous Statistics, a Quantitative Methodology. So please help me welcome Dr. Walter. Ah, ya palingana. That's uh, hello and welcome in the reconstructed uh, Palawakani, Tasmanian Lutruwita Aboriginal language. Why it's reconstructed and why I'm a bit pale for an Aborigine will become clear as we go through the little talk today. So first off, um, my name's Maggie Walter. I'm a member of the uh, Tasmanian Briggs Aboriginal family, large family, and we descended from the Perabina people of Kebrakuna country in northeastern Tasmania. And uh, before I start, I would, of course, like to acknowledge the Indigenous peoples of the Toronto, uh, the Dish with One Spoon Territory, uh, the land of the Anishabi, Mr. Sagwa, and the Haudenosaunee peoples. And I acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging and thank them for the opportunity to speak on the land today. So I want to talk about the Australian situation, but of course the Australian situation can be... Um, people sometimes say that the pattern of Anglo colonisation or the footprint of it is the easiest thing to track in the world. So when I'm talking about Australia, you'll be able to see the same things happening and the same patterns 
uh, in Aotearoa, New Zealand, in Canada, in the US and Hawaii. So in June 2017, more than 250 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander delegates from around Australia met at Uluru, the tr traditional lands of the Pitjantjatjara people, to discuss Indigenous recognition uh, in the Australian Constitution and other things. Um, I was very honoured to be a member of the Tasmanian, the Palawa contingent to, at Uluru. So the result was this, uh, this open letter to non-Indigenous Australia called the Uluru Statement of the Heart. So the, the statement is essentially the same missive written by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to non-Indigenous Australia since colonisation began. It pronounces our unbroken possession of the Australian continent, even as it articulates our ongoing sense of powerlessness and the embedded inequality of our peoples. The core of the statement is in the Indigenous claim to a sovereignty that has never been ceded, positioned as a spiritual notion whereby the ancestral ties between the land of Mother Nature and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who were born therefrom remain attached thereto and must one day return thither to be reunited, united with the ancestors. This is the link and this is the basis of the ownership of the soil or better of sovereignty. So therefore the Illibri statement re-articulates the core Indigenous ontology that relationship to land is both the foundation of our social order and our lived embodied reality. So it's inextricably combined on how we be Aboriginal people. Our relationship to country is what anchors us to our life world from our dual intersubjectivities as Indigenous peoples, where on the one hand, our everyday reality is shaped by our traditional and ongoing culture, our belief systems, practices, identities, and ways of understanding the world and our own place in it, but also as dispossessed Indigenous peoples with our everyday realities also shaped by our contested historical and ongoing, very fraught and very unequal relationship with the colonising nation state. Oops, what's happened there? Ah, here we go. I got too smart for myself. Because in 1770, the mere raising of the British flag by a British naval officer at Possession Island in North Queensland claimed the entire Australian continent for the British Crown. So this legal trickery deemed the Aboriginal ab inhabitants as being without sovereign or system of land tenure, distinguishable to British eyes anyway, making the country unowned or terra nullius. So this was officially overturned in 1993 but the legacy of terra nullius continues into our life world intersubjectivities via our continued marginalisation and the continued denial of our lands, our rights to the land. So under terra nullius, Aboriginal people were made to legally disappear as the owners of their country, of our country. Such declarations, of course, didn't make our populations disappear. That job had to be done by hand through the processes of colonisation, inclusive of dis dispossessing violence, massacres, greed, deceit, duplicity, corruption, mistreatment, willful indifference, theft, contempt and dehumanisation. So the near genocide, the very near genocide of my own Palawa peoples from Litruwita, Tasmania is a really good case study. So in the early 1800s, small British colonial outposts were established at either end of the island ostensibly to keep the prowling uh, French at bay. Our resistance brought unrestrained violence and military decrees, military law, which hurtled my forebears from the people of the land to a handful of scarred survivors to, in just a few short years. Kidnapped to work as slaves and concubines in the sealing trade, driven from our traditional homelands and hunting grounds to allow the land to, for British settlement, our last survivors of these depredations were forcibly removed from Tasmania and imprisoned on the Bass Strait Islands. At the end of this, it had only been, what, 40 and 30 years, less than fewer than 10 women survived to raise children who went on to have children of their own. Four of those were sisters. My own matriarch, Watamatiena, was herself a survivor of sealer abduction 
And even today, however, it's still considered impolite in most Tasmanian circles to talk about colonisation, genocide, dispossession or the ongoing uh, survivors, the descendants of those survivors. So the sparse official discourse that is there talks about these events as tragic, as if they happened all by themselves, uh, that sort of act of nature. And the narrative of colonial ownership remains dominant. So I'll let you read that one by yourself. So in June 2018, just a month ago, the traditional name for the Hobart area, Nipaluna, was gifted by the Aboriginal community to the Hobart City Council. This is a dual name. So it was received positively in some quarters, in others it was open hostility. So the, this letter was published in a local, um, local newspaper and it sums up some of the arguments that were presented quite strongly that Tasmania has an Aboriginal past or a contemporary reality is deemed deeply problematic. So even a, a surface textual analysis reveals the letter's discursive intent is to position the gift of the name as a source of excessive difficulties, because people have to learn to say Nipaluna, evidently, untenable divisiveness and non-Indigenous discomfort. So the truth modalities are deployed to deem the name Nipaluna an unacceptable reminder of the colonising past, with Aboriginal people named, labelled unreasonable in their reference to that past. We're exhorted to stop making de demands, which I translate as making no references to colonisation, and it's equates social harmony with Aboriginal silences on pra practices of dispossession. It sort of betrays a, a very deep unease. So, as I said, this is the Australian experience, but we can extend this to uh, other Anglo colonised places. So, there's stark similarities in our colonising history and our contemporary marginalised socio economic and political positioning in Tasmania in Uttarawa, New Zealand, the United States and Canada. So colonised first world nations such as Australia are undergirded by a specific set of narratives, logics and epistemologies. So as argued by Glenn, settler colonialism is a distinct transnational formation whose political and economic projects have shaped and continue to shape race relations in nation states established through dispossession. Or as Wolf terms it, Invasion is a structure, not an event. And the structure of invasion is founded on land dispossession. And in the Anglo context, land dispossession is always meant to be complete. So the link between land injustice and social injustice can be demonstrated by looking at colonial history and the contemporary uh, social positioning of Aboriginal people. And this is best done at the level of pace. Um, so I've used, in this next bit, I've used uh, data from the 2016 Australian National uh, Census of Population and Housing to look at three very different uh, geographically diverse areas in Australia. So Perth, the capital city of Western Australia, Dubbo, which is a very large regional town in New South Wales, and Maningrida, which is a remote Indigenous community in the Northern Territory. So first to Dubbo. Oh, there's Tebracuna country. I just threw that in because I like it. <laughs> All right, there's Dubbo. So you can see it's out there from, uh, from Sydney. It's 400 kilometres northwest of Sydney. It's a major re regional hub and it's a traditional land of the Wiradjuri people. The traditional owners of the specific area around uh, Dubbo are the Tabagar people, and they were dispossessed during frontier violence from the 1800s till about the 1850s. So in 1898, the New South Wales Aboriginal Protection Board opened the Tabagar Reserve, and under various legislations, and note this, not fully overturned until 1969, Aboriginal people in Dubbo were precluded from being sold alcohol, from voting at the state or federal level, uh, they had their wages paid to an official rather than themselves and they could and often did have their children taken for them, from them by the families, uh, by the board rather. So in the early 1970s, the last residents of Talbagar were moved into public housing, creating the Gordon Estate in West Dubbo, which in turn was dismantled as problematic in recent years, with many of the former residents just spread throughout the town. 
In 1995, the Tabagar lodged a native title claim over 16 hectares at the uh, Tamungarine Reserve, which is a traditional, long traditional, many thousands of years traditional gathering place. This claim was immediately contested by local and state authorities through the court system, who claimed that there was a, a, a historic stock trail in the area, so therefore it couldn't be Aboriginal land. An agreement was finally reached in 2002 to share the site. Now this is just a brief table of the uh, comparative socioeconomic positions of the Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal populations of Davao. As you can see, um, rates of unemployment are triple, rates of home ownership are much lower, uh, rates of higher education much, much lower. On to Perth. Okay, so the Noongar people are the traditional owners of the land of Perth and from they were de dispossessed from 1829 onwards and in 1886 the colonial guardianship was imposed and many Noongar were forcibly removed to settlements such as, and settlements in inverted commas, such as the Karalup native settlement. The Aborigines Act of 1905 legislated that people could be, were excluded from voting, could be removed to the reserve, could be arrested without warrant, and it required Aboriginal women to seek permission to marry a non-Aboriginal person. Again, the remnants of this Act were not finally repealed until 1972. In 2006, the Noongar Indigenous Family Groups made a claim for the area, and uh, they were successful. The Western Australian and Commonwealth governments, of course, immediately appealed and the ruling was overturned in 2008. There's been ongoing um, discussion since then. It's still, the settlement's still not been finalised, but there is an agreement with the state government um, and the Aboriginal Land and Sea Council for reparations and uh, some large tracts of Crown land. Again, this is the socio-economic positioning of the people of Aboriginal people of Perth very similar patterns as we saw in Dubbo. Finally, on to Manangrida. So Manangrida is right up in the Northern Territory. It's a, um, about 500 kilometres east of Darwin and the traditional owners are the Kambidji people. The Aboriginal Ordinance Act 1918, again not repealed until 1971, uh, meant that the all Aboriginal people were deemed wards of the state with the Chief Protector of Aborigines controlling Aboriginal children. People had to live in designated reserves. Aboriginal people were excluded from voting and could not conduct, marry without permission or conduct business in their own rights. In 1976, the Federal Aboriginal Land Rights Northern Territory Act gave inalienable freehold title of the area to the Indigenous people. But in 2007, this control was disrupted when the town was included as one of the 73 Aboriginal towns covered by the Northern Territory National Emergency Response Act 2007. Under this act, the town's lease was compulsorily acquired by the federal government, who still has it. The traditional owners challenged the validity of the town lease uh, on the basis that the property was acquired on unjust terms, but this was case was dismissed. Now, I've only included the Aboriginal population here because um, the 90% are Aboriginal and the 10% of non-Aboriginal people aren't people who were born there. They're people who come in um, providing all the services. They're the teachers, they're the police, they're the post office workers, etc. So what we can see from these three case studies that though each of them has a very different colonising history and they are very ge geographically diverse, they all display very strong similarities both in the process of dispossession now and then and contemporary social injustice. Each were possessed at different times but that pattern of dispossession is remarkably consistent. First the colonial forces arrive, usually with the settlers ready to take up vacated land in tow and colonial violence ensues. Once resistance has been squashed militarily, those remaining are controlled and separated from the non-Indigenous population through constraining legislations. And for all three populations, despite the narrative of Australian egalitarianism, 
the last vestiges of these raci racially oppressive legislations remained in place well into the latter half of the 20th century. Each traditional group has again also tried to reclaim some of their stolen lands in recent times, but with very varied mixed fortunes. What is consistent is the immediate resistance, usually through the courts, of the political mechanisms of the Australian national state, nation state to those claims. And all three populations had experienced high level socioeconomic disadvantage. And this disadvantage was instituted formally alongside the dispossession. The concluding interpretation is that for dispossessed peoples in Australia and elsewhere, escaping the confines of international, intergenerational socioeconomic disadvantage includes addressing rights to land. Yet there is a continuing and very dedicated effort by the nation state to decouple the dispossession of Australia's first peoples and the embedded inequalities that frame those people's lives. So that brings me back to the Uluru Statement we're referring to the dire circumstances that our peoples live in now. We talk about these dimensions of our crisis tell plainly the structural nature of our problem, the torment of our, pow our powerlessness. We seek constitutional reforms to empower our people and to take a rightful place in our own country. We call for the establishment of a First Nations voice enshrined in the Constitution. We seek a Makarata Commission to supervise a process uh, agreement making between governments and First Nations and truth tellings about our history. Thank you. Unfortunately, there are too many parallels with the Canadian case as well. Thank you. Um, and so, our third and final paper of the day is by Christina Cielo. And she'll be giving a paper entitled Extractivism, Dispossession, and Gender Transformations in, of Territoriality. Dr. Cielo is a professor and researcher in the Department of Sociology and Gender Studies in the Latin American Faculty for Social Sciences in Quito, Ecuador. Her work explores the subjective dimensions of social and material inequalities produced by the institutional organization of resource management, legitimate knowledge, and political representation. Her current projects include research on popular uh, and knowledge economies of the global south and care and capitalism in extractive sites. So please um, join me in welcoming Dr. Cielo. Great, thank you very much. Um, thank you. Uh, for um, having us here. Um, it's wonderful to be able to hear experiences in different places. Um, and I'm gonna speak about Latin America and current uh, forms of dispossession. I first went to Latin America, um, I grew up in Mexico, but I returned um, after being in the States for a while, precisely because it seemed a place of much hope um, in the 2000s. Um, the Latin American left turn in the 2000s brought hope for redistribution to a region that has historically been among the most unequal in the world. In both Bolivia and Ecuador, two of the countries declaring socialism of the 21st century, indigenous social movements were prominent among the coalitions that replaced neoliberal parties and swept in a transformative period in the region. The ambitious new policies of these countries included the nationalization of strategic sectors and the expansion and centralization of state institutions. This was all made possible by the primary commodity boom of the last decade, driven by global transformations in emerging and speculative economies. Um, South American countries have long been dependent on exporting Oh, wait, because I'm so small. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, good. Ah, I can see everybody over there. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much. All right. Um, so um, South American countries have, have long been dependent on primary um, commodity export, exporting. 
um, in the last decade, the value of these raw material exports has reached up over 90% of both Bolivian and Ecuadorian total exports. High oil and gas prices permitted what has been called the consensus of commodities. It's also been called neo-extractivism. And um, this attempts to describe a period in which neoliberal economic policies are replaced by state takeover of extractive rent. In this period, public investments, um, public budgets grew and investments in health, education, and infrastructure have effectively decreased poverty throughout the region. This has changed in the last couple of years um, since oil prices have fallen. But given the importance of indigenous movements in the new nations of both Bolivia and Ecuador, each of these was refounded in new constitutions, 2000, 2008, respectively, um, as a plurinational state. The idea of plurinationalism was that diverse indigenous nationalities and their ontologies, their, their authorities, their ways of knowing, were to be integrated into an intercultural state framework. Ecuador's 2008 constitution also named and protected the rights of nature. But what we found is that these profound changes, despite seeking a more inclusive social order, have nevertheless brought about new forms of inequalities and gendered and ethnic hierarchies. And this has to do with a lot of what my colleagues were speaking about. What happens when redistributive policies are built on, founded on uh, modern epistemologies? So uh, what we've seen is that unequal development and dispossession do not only take place through the material occupation of oil-rich territories, which is what's happening in the Ecuadorian Amazon, but also, and more importantly in my research, through subjective transformations in these areas. In other words, dispossession does not always mean the direct loss of land, but rather the transformation of inhabitants' affective and embodied relationships with their surroundings and the incorporation of these relations into processes of capital accumulation. But my point here is not only to show that indigenous populations whose lands there are bid in um, licensing rounds to oil companies, I don't only want to show that they're increasingly being incorporated into a market economy, although that is also the case. Nor do I really want to simply argue against the loss of their traditional ways, which actually have been and continue to be continually reproduced and recreated over decades of interactions and trade with state and church actors, with rubber barons, with colonists, with commercial traders, and now with the Colombian paramilitary. What I would like to explore instead um, are the changes in indigenous people's possibilities to negotiate and articulate diverse forces for their reproduction. With the incorporation of their lands into the petroleum circuit, indigenous people lose autonomy in the reinventions of their identities, of their traditions, and their social and natural relations. Their possibilities to continue changing on their own terms is what decreases. In this shift, as we'll see in what follows, both gender and ethnic identifications become more individualized and, stri and more strictly defined. So my work um, over the last years has been in sites in both the South Central, which is kind of the middle part um, underneath the Yasuni National Park of the, of the Amazon, where oil is not yet exploited, and also in the Northern Amazon, um, the area where all the purple lines go through. The purple lines are the oil pipelines, oil and gas pipelines. Um, and that area, the northern Amazon, has been um, exploited since um, 1973. So I begin by describing some of the territories and identities in the southern central Amazon, in areas less incorporated into development and oil projects. Ecologies in these areas are characterized by complex interdependence, that is, by care activities and a material coexistence with life beyond humans. This is a world in which differences between animals, plants, and spirits, they need each other. People need people, animals all need the diversity. Negotiating these diverse connections is central to establishing stability and persistence. In this sense, security is not about uniform uniformity, but rather is about the articulation of differences across the human and the non-human. It's a taking care of, a becoming responsible for, and a belonging together. 
uh, of beings that is not always harmonious, but is always changeable. Simone Bignall calls these complex selves, is the term she used, in which interdependent members have a vital interest in safeguarding the conditions that protect each other's diversity. These complex selves are what characterize, characterize Amazonian reproductive cycles. So in this context, gender is quite clearly not an individual trait, but rather a relational one. Gender is anchored in what men and women do, the spaces they occupy, and the relations they have. Men and women, for example, incorporate the non-human world differently into their bodies. Men inhale tobacco to ensure a successful hunt. Women submerge themselves in the river in their daily chores and speak to snake spirits to ensure a good crop. These articulated, oops, sorry, these articulated activities make up the territories of indigenous communality. Over time, of course, these have shifted as indigenous people's productive and reproductive relations have changed. The Sapara, which is a nationality with whom we worked in the South Central Amazon region, um, in the 1980s sought to defend their territory um, from the first oil company explorations. And what they did was they began to strengthen their nationality's political organization. What this meant, however, was adopting state-recognized forms of organizing themselves, in which men were the cultural brokers between their communities and the mestizo society. In that period, the Sapara also came into con constant contact with environmental NGOs that linked the preservation of tropical forests with the protection of indigenous culture. These NGOs encouraged the notion of indigenous people as innate environmentalists, and particularly indigenous women as protectors of traditional knowledge. In the most recent political mobilizations in Ecuador, indigenous women themselves have marshaled this ethno-political discourse to affirm themselves as less corrupt than their male counterparts in the defense of their territories. So there continue to be transformations in these assemblages that connect indigenous groups, urban environmental activists, and state actors. In this sense, the diversity that makes up indigenous territory is defined both by the national biodiversity that characterizes the Amazon and also by indigenous people's transactions and mediations with diverse social groups. So we turn now to communities um, in the northern Amazon whose lands have become strate strategic oil sites for the national economy and for capital accumulation. For these communities, it is not only their material subsistence that is threatened, but in terms of what I've been describing, what is compromised is their possibility to negotiate diverse contingencies open-endedly, to make connections with both social and non-human worlds, and to take advantage of these articulations for their own reproduction. We especially see this loss of the active construction of social and ecological territories in those places where, development, uh, where the developmental state has intervened in indigenous communities. In the northern Amazon, long a site of oil drilling, um, this development project, which is called the Millennium City, um, it's one of about five Millennium Cities. At one point, Rafael Correa announced that there would be 200 um, Millennium Cities in the Ecuadorian Amazon. Um, I, but, but up to this point, five or six only have been built. Um, it, so in this, uh, in this development project of the Millennium Cities, this was built to compensate inhabitants for the negative, um, for the, for the negative externalities of drilling in, in, on their lands. In this site, what we've seen is an immense shift in gendered territories and ethnic identifications. Uh, this Millennium City is surrounded by a wildlife reserve. There's um, 68 prefabricated houses on it. Each of them has identical furnishings. They were, each of the families were given an electric stove, a computer, and a bike. Um, the urbanization was built on this area. This is a picture um, of the area previous to the Millennium City. Um, and it was, it's built right on top of that area. Most community members of the, the uh, community is called Playas de Cuyaveno. They lived um, kilometers away along the river. It's only accessible by river, um, this community. Um, the families had to, however, commit to living in the urbanized area in order to receive one of the houses. So as they're not allowed, it's, 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 a, it's a strictly regulated um, community, and they're not allowed to keep animals there, nor is there space to grow crops. 
So what happens is that residents are separated from the plants and animals that, had not long that, that they had not long ago cared for and depended on. Um, many younger families, and especially the children, are increasingly loath to travel to the farms. And so kids' amazement and even fear of the jungle animals, we, we did workshop with children both in the southern central with the Sapara communities and in Playas de Cuyaveno. And um, there's a real difference in how the children, wh what it is it that um, awes them. And um, whereas they, they before they were in awe of the jungle, of the animals and their spirits, um, that awe has been transformed or, or translated um, over to the oil, the powerful oil platforms. As consumption also shifts towards commercial goods, residents' relationships with what are now considered wild animals and plants is both simplified and distanced. These transformed relations are not only physical, but also affective, um, in terms of affective ecologies which are, which are shaped, producing new territories. If gender differentiation before served in the diverse interdependence of human and non-human activities for the reproduction, for social um, and natural reproduction, women now become responsible for new care activities in their, in their urbanized home. Care work now means assuring their family's sustenance through domestic activities and paid employment when, it, when, when they can find it, to ensure that they can pay for utilities, which they now have to pay for, purchase food, and sustain their children's education. With increasing demands to make money and care for their house and neighborhood, residents of the Millennium City find it more and more difficult to spend time attending to the surrounding animal and spirit worlds. This shapes an insistently social as opposed to ecological organization in the, in the Millennium City. In this context, the territories of women's care work are domesticated. The human and natural worlds are separated, as are the public productive and private reproductive spheres, as um, Silvia Federici describes um, when she talks about the beginnings of capitalism, the foundings of capitalism in Europe. Such a delimitation of their territories of care increases women's dependence on commodity and labor markets more easily accessed by men. Indigenous identities have also been reshaped in this context. Um, historically, very different kinds of NGOs worked in, in the northern Amazon. Um, social mobility is what seemed to be possible when um, indigenous people worked with um, NGOs. NGOs in the northern Amazon promoted development projects as opposed to, in contrast to the ecological NGOs working in the southern central Amazon. So mestizo identities um, were, were what were desired because these opened possibilities of access to goods and services. And, and this is really violently played out among the children in the Millennium City School, um, small community um, bilingual schools, intercultural schools were closed in different communities and the children uh, were sent to the uh, much larger, uh, much more infrastructurally, um, uh, much more, much better infrastructurally school. And, and what we find, what we found there was um, a very strong racialization and um, degradation of ethnic identities of the Kofan, the Sequoia, the smaller uh, indigenous groups, um, as opposed to and by mestizo and Quechua identities. And in fact, indigenous girls suffered more sexual harassment than mestizo and Quechua girls because the boys would say, they don't say anything, so they could bother them. So these hierarchies are parts of new subjectivities, which are social rather than ecological, that accompany the material and effective transformations of Amazon areas. There are still multiple and complex relations that characterize these um, social realities, but these incorporate less biodiverse difference into their becoming. Territories of care are increasingly limited um, and to in both the human sphere and to an involvement with actors driven by capital accumulation rather than diverse articulation. But I'd like to end now with um, insisting on my point that it's not, m m idea, it's um, indigenous interdependence and traditional ways do need to be protected, but not only for their own sake. Um, for me, it's the limiting of indigenous people's contingent connections and their negotiations with a diverse set of beings um, that endangers their sustenance and their security. <laughs>
As their emergent connections are limited, their ethnic and gendered hierarchies are individualized and their lines are hardened. So extractivism, um, and, and uh, with um, colleagues in Latin America, we're trying to think through extractivism as a contemporary logic uh, as a contemporary logic of capital. Um, extractivism in this sense is not only the dispossession of land, but also the expropriation of possibilities and participation in extended and diverse territories and communities of care. Thank you. So now we have, sorry, we have about 20 minutes for questions. If you can please use the microphones, there's some numbered microphones along uh, in the middle of the aisles. Um, if you can line up behind the microphones if you have a question. Keep your questions short so that we can uh, address as many questions as possible and we'll also ask our, our presenters to um, provide shortish answers depending on the number of questions we're getting. Um, so we'll open it up to discussion. Can you? Just go right to the microphone. Uh, I'm conducting research on the impacts of corporate mining on indigenous communities in the Philippines. And I'm beginning to see the commonalities of the experience in Latin America, in some parts of Asia and, and North America, including Australia. Um, one of the things that I see missing is when we talk about violence and extractivism, I think there's enough discussion on the nation state, but we are not yet targeting the power and the violence of extractive capitalism as they are embodied in transnational corporations that are actually uh, dominating extractive industries especially in third world countries, and the Philippines is a good example of that. So what my question is, how do we sociologists who are supposed to be uh, advocating for social justice through knowledge production and advocacy and action, how can we come up with an international uh, challenge to, these, uh, to the violence of extractive capitalism? Um, thank you. I'm also, uh, my parents are from the Philippines, so I'm also Filipina. <laughs> um, so it's wonderful to, thank you for your question. Um, for me, part of what's interesting in Ecuador is um, the articulation of urban, especially young urban activists, environmental activists, with Amazonian um, indigenous people. and. I think until people outside of the territories that are being um, expropriated, until we feel, the, the idea of the complex self for me really helps me to think through the way that we are made up interdependently. And until it's more than an intellectual understanding of our interdependence, once we um, realize, I think, that we do need each other. Um, in, we, we need the land, we need the animals, we do need the spirits. Um, only then, I think, on a, on a, and on a multi-scalar way, only then can we begin to um, challenge um, the force of capital. Um. Um, I, I think sociology is largely missing from any of these arguments, um, even uh, addressing the oppressive powers of the nation state, let alone of extractive capital. Um, we seem to, this is my opinion, and mm -hmm. I hope somebody will challenge me on it, um, is that we seem to have lost sight of uh, the big picture and really tackling the big social injustices and have become mired in, in the small stuff. So, um, it would be great, but I think that really that there is no major, there's some wonderful books coming out. Uh, we're getting back in touch with sociology's key um, aim of, of social justice, but it, we're not anywhere near there yet. <laughs> 
Hi. Um, my question is for Margaret Walter and um, Maria Christina. Uh, so it, it kind of thinking about your presentations together. One really nitty gritty question, right, is um, who is the national actor in this actual case who is extracting from the ground? And then to sort of tie that into um, the other presentation, to me it's really fascinating that um, the mining corporations that often go into Latin America or go into the Philippines come from um, areas where settler colonialism is quite advanced, right? Mm -hmm. And then those mining companies mm -hmm. come from places like Canada and they go into Latin America or they go into the Philippines and they already have really advanced tactics for dealing with them. Mm -hmm. But here in the global north, right, the indigenous people have learned for a really long time um, what these practices are about and what the mining companies are actually doing, right? And how they're trying to expropriate the land, re-territorialize the people, and sort of destroy the culture, right? They don't want to do that, but it's sort of a, a way to get resources. So I wonder, right, um, is that happening? Are these sort of practices flowing from the gro global north into the global south? And secondly, might there be a way that resistance movements in the global north that have been dealing with these extractive um, corporations for a really long time enter into sort of solidarity movements with people in the global south and actually begin to educate them and teach them about stuff that's been going on in their territory for a really long time? And I just want to say that this is a fabulous panel, and you guys all did so well. And Patricia, you did amazing, so thank you. <laughs> Look, it's still happening in the advanced um, First Nations, colonised nation states. I mean, in Australia, the mining companies are still appropriating and dispossessing Aboriginal peoples. <laughs> some, some of the, the um, native title, people were given land that was presumed to be worthless and it's now, of course, been found to be full of uh, iron ore and other things and the dispossession just comes straight back again. So. I'm not sure that um, Indigenous peoples in the first world colonised nation states have much to mm -hmm. tell because we're still being, um, we're still being dispossessed, we're still being, uh, have our land taken and it's just that perhaps they're a little less, mm -hmm. they're, they're probably rawer in the way that they go into the global south but the practices and the behaviours are the same. I would say uh, that for me it goes back to um, your talk and of sort of the epistemologies that underlie um, what we're trying to understand and what, what we're trying to, um, and how we try to um, challenge the violences of dispossession. Um, it's hard, I mean, I, how, do these, how can these articulations take place between the global north and between the global south um, in a way that is, in, in, in a way that open spaces um, for, uh, for, for different epistemologies in a structure in which you need modern rights mm -hmm. in order to, to make claims. I mean, I think that's really complicated. Um, modern rights, um, identities um, help in this fight, but they also close off possibilities. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if that makes sense. Thank you all for three very thought-provoking uh, presentations. I guess my question is to all of you in some ways, but particularly to Christina, because you focused on the foreclosing of multiple cells and the possibilities with extractivism, not just the dispossession of land, but this larger epistemic and ontological questions. Are there also possibilities that open up? Because very often, you know, it's not possibilities that foreclose, but some that open. And so do you see that in your work in the region? Um, I mean, I, I've been trying, I, I, I love the work of Abdul Malik Simon, uh, and I just interviewed him. I don't know, he's an urban, if, if any of you know his work, he's an uh, African urban theorist who works in Asia and uh, Africa. And uh, he, I, I had a long interview with him, um, and I think we can learn a lot from him in Latin America because he looks for these moments of opening up. He looks for 
uh, ways which new articulations in uh, what he sees, he looks at urban areas, so he looks at huge new development projects. And so what kind of um, sort of emergent collectivities are made possible in, the, in these places? And I, I kept pushing him in the interview to ask him what changes um, as cities um, become more privatized, as land rent uh, becomes higher, as it becomes more and more difficult to live in cities, as public services um, become pay-as-you-go services, um, what shifts in these emergent collectivities? And I, for me, I was, I was trying to think of these two in, uh, together, my case and what he describes in African and Asian cities. And I do think that there's something about um, the connections with uh, sort of th these, these, these connections with um, diverse actors shift when the diverse actors are driven by private capital interests. So I, th I think there is a change. Um, I think there are possibilities, and a lot of the possibilities in Ecuador um, have to do with urban and, um, and uh, um, Amazonian sort of articulations. There's, there's and, and actually have to do with a lot with feminists and um, indigenous women meeting up and supporting each other and working together. So I think there are, in a lot of young people, a lot of young environmentalists, I think there are new um, articulations, new possibilities opening up, but I think there are also difficult, it, it becomes more difficult um, in certain structural contexts in which capital has more uh, power through the nation state. For me, they're not really separate but in, in Ecuador, the post-neoliberal state was supposedly a um, rejection of the importance of, of, of uh, transnational companies. Um, but neo-extractive and has not been less dispossessive of indigenous lands and peoples. Well, thanks very much for a, a marvelous panel. Um, my, my question or comment really is for all of you. Um, and I wanna try to just link what I see as the kind of horror story that links all your presentations together. Um, because I think the, the images of the millennium villages to me are the story of modernity coloniality. Uh, like it's a modernist developmentalist project that is obliterating life worlds. Uh, but in the case of Correa's Ecuador, and you started your talk talking about 21st century socialism and um, you know that that claim to emancipation and the claim to redistribution uh, that it underpins projects like that, and yet it is this reenactment of uh, coloniality in the name of modernization, but a progressive version of modernization, and the state. And the progressive state and the 21st century socialist state is a key, is not the only actor, but it's a key actor in that. And, you know, this links also to Professor Walker's uh, talk about, you know, you ended your talk talking about, of course, the quest for constitutional recognition and how central that politics of recognition is, I mean, just de facto and practically, but how the modern state is also such an agent of that kind of modernity, coloniality process and project. And so I'm just wondering, it's, it's just a, um, an invitation, I guess, to any or all of you to reflect on what this implies or suggests or where you see um, so any kind of anti-colonial politics at work that has some promise of greater autonomy from these processes or some other way of weaving a way around these processes while also obviously and unavoidably having to engage with them on some level. I guess uh, in the presentation that I was giving, I was thinking about the way in which sociology as a discipline and us as sociologists who practice sociology might be complicit in the construction and particularly the legitimation of those processes particularly. 
So if we think about issues of modernity coloniality, and, and I guess just picking up something somebody said earlier about the global south and learning from the global north and, and so on, that the areas in the global south that, that were being mentioned within <coughs> our panel are also settler colonies. So it's not as if Latin America isn't mm -hmm. a settler colonial context in its own terms, just in the same way as the others are Anglo settler colonies. This has similar sorts of dynamics. And so then the question really is, where do indigenous peoples fit within the frameworks that we operate with? Within sociology, <coughs> our central concept really is this idea of the modern, where we are modern, and anybody who isn't modern is outside of our framework. And in being outside of our framework, there's really only two places <coughs> or two things that, that they can do. One is either come and be like us. So the standard definitions of modernization theory was that they would all become like us. <coughs> or in the version of multiple modernities that came to be talked about more recently, they would just remain them, <coughs> as if that difference was something that pre-existed our understanding of ourselves as modern and them being understood as traditional. If we're to understand that we come to understand ourselves as modern in the process of creating others as traditional, not just epistemologically, but also through the historical processes of dispossession <coughs> and elimination that we put people into the past through our very processes that put us into modernity, then we would have to recognize that there's a relationship there of inequality that we're complicit in. And so what, what does that behove us to do in addressing that? Not just in the context of our discipline, not just sociologically and rethinking the terms, the concepts and the paradigms. But if we were to take seriously the welcome that we were given yesterday, what would that mean? If that wasn't just to be a performance, what would our response have to look like to be in good relation with the indigenous peoples of these lands? And that's something that I think that we avoid in disciplinary terms, but we also avoid politically. I think we just have to look at the RC list of this association much as I love this association, but until RCO5 changed our name just less than two years ago to be uh, racism, I can't even get it right now, but indigeneity is in there. In the, there was no mention of indigeneity or indigenous peoples in any of the RCs. So I think your point is well made. And to be the modern, I think in contemporary terms, you, it, it is... You, you are not apart from Indigenous peoples because Indigenous peoples are part of what makes you modern. And our dispossession underpins all of that. Mm -hmm. So I'll issue the same challenge. I, and I, I'd just like to say it's hard because we are academics and in the hierarchies that we're talking about, I mean, we would... it's. It's disciplinary, it's political, and it's very personal. We, I mean, this setting is the kind of setting that reinforces those hierarchies. Um, and we, we would have to find a different way of exchanging and, and being together, uh, I think. Um, and so it's tough when, when we're taking it seriously. One last quick question, we only have Thank you for all the wonderful papers and I think some of the more nuanced articulation of uh, capital, state, gender and other intersectional divisions have been dealt with very successfully. But I want, and that relates to the change of the name of the RCO5 mm -hmm. and mostly to some of the things that Gurminder was saying. Because what we are seeing, because, which relates to the relationship between so-called migration as invasion. Because what we are seeing in the global north, but also in Africa and in other um, places all over the globe, the development of autochthony politics of belonging, which reify and fix who belong and who has the right to live somewhere and others have no right. How do we reconcile land rights, uh, preserving uh, 
uh, effective communal social relations with also the need and the wish, and I would also add the right of people to migrate and to move away from where they were born. How can we do it in a way in which migration will not construct imageries of invasion also when the migrants are powerless ref asylum seekers fleeing from conflict zones, uh, partly at least caused by what happened um, by colonialism and, and, and uh, neoliberalism, but of course also as a, as a result of uh, local um, uh, conflict zone, etc. So I think uh, if I can have some kind of response on that, that would be great. Thanks. Thank you. That'll be the last question. I'm really I sorry. We're up. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Let me just take a second. Oh, why don't we? Why don't you ask the question and then we can address them together? Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Sorry, I, d I can't. I'm see sorry, the light. but uh, my question is whether you teach at the grad or undergrad level, and if you do, whether you teach uh, these different ep epistemologies that we were talking about today and in which ways, and if that doesn't happen at the university, if it does happen at a different place, would you please speak about that? Gracias. Thank you, thank you. Just a quick, quick response. Okay, big topics and quick <laughs> response. I mean, so, I, was, I mean, the first thing in response to Nira, I think that within the social sciences, mobility and migration is over-valorized. I don't think the majority of the human population moves to the extent that we have made mobility such a central part of the ways in which we think about stuff and that when people do move, they often move as a consequence of the actions of others. So war, devastation, famine, climate change, these are things that we produce in the West. The consequences are visited on people elsewhere and then when they move, we try and stop them moving. But then I think the issue in relation to that is to sort of think about what it is that we can stop doing that creates other, pl other people's places as uninhabitable and the need to move from them. And so perhaps a different sort of frame to think about that. Um, but I'm really happy to talk about it much more. On the issue of teaching and the university, I would just like to say, I mean, when I started teaching, I got given a course to teach called Modernity and Globalization. And over the period of seven years of teaching it and being un dissatisfied with it, trying to sort of rework it, I ended up creating it as Race and the Making of the Modern World, mm -hmm. which centered dispossession, elimination, enslavement, and, its, and extraction as the core processes that create the modern world. And it's almost as if we don't center those processes as what makes the modern world, but we continue to peddle the myth the mythology of the Industrial Revolution and, and the French Revolution as key sites of modernity, then we do a real disservice to our students and our discipline because we promote and propagate erroneous understandings which don't help us to address the problems that we continue to face in the present. It's the height of hypocrisy, isn't it, when people who have invaded another people's country and completely dispossessed them then speak to asylum seekers and others as if they are being attacked and putting them in the language of invasion. It just, uh, and even, you know, the, the British, you know, it just sort of, I always wander around places like Manchester and think there should be big signs on all the buildings saying this building or the cost of this building involuntarily donated by the peoples of India or South Africa or Australia. Uh, so, yes, it, it makes me laugh in a very bitter way <laughs> when people talk about sort of, um, especially this, what's happening here in the, uh, or in the United States. With the teaching, yes, I do teach it, and I teach uh, Indigenous um, item uh, courses and about race, but uh, we were talking about this the other day. Race is almost entirely missing from the sociological canon. It's just not taught in sociology departments all over the place. and. We've got race, class, and gender. We get class and gender, but race just seems to be missing, and I don't know why. Is it people feel uncomfortable with talking about race? Because as sociologists, we really should be across this. 
So please join me uh, in thanking our panel. We have a lot of really uh, call, call to action, I think. So thank you so much. Thank you. And we're out of time, so I'm sure we can continue our conversations through uh, through a break and so on. So thank, thank you so much. Rescue me.